Hold on, we're trying to go live right now. I think this time it did. Hallelujah. Yes, we finally got live connection. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. This is your host, Elder Anton Seals of AJS Ministry. We lift up Elder Jennifer Seals, who's not available. She's at work. We thank you, God. Continue to cover her, strengthen her. Watch over her, give her peace of mind, oh God, and safety all around her. And to all the women of God, oh God, to all the men and women that are out and about, oh God, the children, oh God, we thank you for your protection. Lord, we know, we know that you're already there, so we're just thanking you, oh God, for the shield of protection, for the spirit of the living God. Lord, we don't have to put no blood on the doorpost. All we got to do is call on the name of Jesus. And so, God, do your spirit cover everybody's home, cover their traveling mercy in the name of Jesus, God. And we thank you for Clarence. We don't see him, but we know, God, that he's he's online, oh God. He may be on mute, but he's on every week. And we just thank you for the abundant blessings of the Lord that make of the rich and addeth no sorrow to each of you that are on this line. We thank you for Elder Jeanette, oh God, Evangelist Jeanette uh, Kruger, God. Comfort her heart, oh God. We lift up Sister Willa May, oh God, and thank you, God, for her uh, being on this class ever since last summer, oh God. Every time we teach a class, her and her sisters have been so encouraging and supportive. So I thank you, God, not only for, for their presence, oh God, but all that they do, oh God, especially with the words of encouragement in the prayers. I thank you, God, for Brother Stanley Nevels, oh God, who's my prayer partner, oh God, and all the other men of God that pray every Monday and throughout the week, oh God. We thank you in the name of Jesus for answered prayers, miracles, and signs and wonders. To all of you that are listening, that we did, we ask, oh God, that you would touch and touch their ears, touch their eyes, touch their mouths, oh God, everything that they do, let it bring glory to you. Every word that comes out of their mouths, oh God, let it bring glory to you, oh God, and cast down every wicked thought, oh God, and cast out every demon that will come against them right now in the name of Jesus. We pray today as we enter into the holy court, into the courts of God, the outer court, the inner court, and uh, eventually the holy holies as we teach on the tabernacle. It's a prayer relationship of sacrifice. We don't have to give anything but a willing sacrifice give thyself as a living sacrifice. We don't have to bring no blood, no lambs and all of that, God. You, when you rent the veil, you released your spirit to come forth in each one of us. And we thank you for the rivers of living water for every soul that's on the line. God, I lift up right now the Miller family, Brother Andre Miller and his family, oh God, who lost his wife Joyce and their mother, oh God, and a week ago, January 26th, oh God, and that one passed away in an hour apart, the other passed away. So Lord, come Comfort his heart, comfort the family, comfort the young man that used to come. I think his Brandon used to come to the uh, Bible Sunday school class where Dr. Krugman and Evangelist Krugman were uh, in that class, oh God. Her husband led that class, God. And so we thank you, God, for the blood covering. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that's covering them right now to strengthen Brother Andre and the Miller family and all the friends, oh God. Lift up Victory Apostolic Church for all those that, that are going through, the leaders, oh God, the pastor Singleton, oh God, and all those involved, oh God, the, the team of ministers and servants, oh God, that are and involved, oh God, in, in serving through all of these funerals that are going on. Strengthen them, Father, all the churches, oh God. We count it done for your glory in Jesus' name. Lord, well, this is a, a, a class, people of God, but we pray in the name of Jesus. You, you can't talk about the tabernacle and not have a prayer life because all of this was about relationship and intimacy, getting into a closer walk with Jesus. Jesus requires some time with God, some, some time in your prayer closet. It doesn't have to be a physical prayer closet. You could be praying in your car on the way to work, but there comes a time where you've got to set some time aside just for you and God. And so you are the tabernacle, and there's a livers, livers of will, that should have been, uh, rivers of living water down on the inside of you. You are a spirit, and the spirit of living God dwelleth in you. You are flesh and, and a human being, but there's the spirit of living God. God that's in you. You breathe life into you. And so, Lord, we thank you for the manifestation of power on this teaching today. Have your way, God. Have your way in the name of Jesus. This is your host, Elder Anton Seals, and we're, we're going to begin teaching on in our book, The Tabernacle Dwells in You. And there's quite a bit to cover. Uh, and I just want to share with all of you as we get into this lesson today, uh, I'm going to be covering there's, uh, we're not going to be able to cover everything that I thought that I wanted to do because it's just too much 
Uh, and so the outline that you have is where we're going to be at. Well, starting on page, uh, I think it's 69 and some book 70 on the others. Uh, but on page 69, you'll see, uh, and I'm going to put this up on the share screen so that people that are listening and looking in on us live can, can see this on Facebook. Uh, I'm praying that it'll open. You all pray with me, and then I'm going to show you the video. Um, and and this, is, this is the picture uh, that I wanted you all to focus on uh, right now. If you can see this, uh, prayerfully you can. Um, can you see this picture with the tent? I need somebody just let me know if you can see it. Okay. I can see uh, it. I can see okay, it. Okay, thank you. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much. And so the tabernacle of Moses is what we're going to be discussing today and leading into uh, the outer court, the outer court. If you notice this long arrow here, and, and if you have your Bibles, I want us to read um, part of, uh, in fact, it's in the lesson, so we'll read it from the book. Uh, but Exodus 27, Exodus 27, we're going to cover some of that. It talks about the direct command, the direct command that God gave to Moses, the instructions, the, the, the precise instructions that he gave Moses to build. I, and, and there was a uh, this outer court. This represents the entrance of the three courts. This is the first court. Outside of this is, is, is considered just where the camp is made. And we showed that last week. And we're not going to go back to that today, but this camp is, is if you imagine this being your church, everything in the parking lot outside where it says East Gate, this is the entrance way. And so when you come in, these, these, these uh, pillars, there were 60 of them on, uh, there's 20 on each side, 10 on, on, on the south, 20 on the south, 20 on the uh, north. Then there are uh, 10 that go across the front, but also as you don't see it here, but there are also six other pillars that make up 66 that represents the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible. And the 60 pillars that are here represents the 60 generational lines of, of men from the line of Judah, uh, the birth line, the birth line of Jesus Christ. Amen. So there's symbolic uh, history here that's more than just a symbol, but it's, it's, it is real and there's a connection to every part of the Bible that the Lord has given to these men and women that played a major part in the writing of the Bible and the teaching of the Bible, of the spreading of the word of God back in the Old Testament, hallelujah, where there was no microphones and there was no cell phone, there was no internet, there was no, no jet to get on. You went by foot and by mule or donkey or horse. Um, however you traveled, you traveled. But this, this lesson, the, the tabernacle, and I want to just point out some things. We're going to show a three or four minute video the tabernacle, I'm right here. I want you to notice it says the time of dwelling meeting place was camped, surrounded by white woven linen. And, and this represents the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. Um, the, 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 the one of the things that I, I, I miss, I'm not having my PowerPoint because I could just be showing the PowerPoint and walking through this at the same time. But when you have to keep going back and forth, it becomes difficult. Uh, but I just want to share this with you because I want to show this video. And so I want to just point out a couple more things here. It served as a barrier that's, that's separating the dark tents, this, which represents to us the sins of the world, the enemies of the righteousness of God. The only court, the only way into the court was at this east entrance. You could not enter into the court with God except the court of the tabernacle, except by the hand of God through this east gate. These men and, and that were on the inside of this gate, the men would come as the priests and they would receive your sacrifice. So if you were of any of the tribes and you came in, you could bring your sacrifice, but you couldn't stay. Amen. You, you could enter the court. And this entering into the court is that before I show this video, it represents, if you will, it represents your relationship with God. You're, it's the beginning of your relationship. So as we talk about the tabernacle, the meeting place, it's a tent. This represents the meeting place of God. And, and I'm going to show you some things today to show you how, how this ties into the coming of the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ and the relationship that we have with the Old Testament, New Testament today. The Moses and Aaron as the, Aaron as the high priest, um, and, and actually Moses is the only man that ever was in the presence of God like that. And so we want to thank God for 
for the writing of this word, but you enter at the feet of Jesus. They're entering at the feet of Jesus because this was symbolizing entering into the presence of God, into the holy place of God called the outer court. And in the outer court, they had a brazen altar, which was a sacrifice, and there was a lavier. You're going to find and understand that anytime you hear the word uh, brazen, we're talking about uh, uh, brass, and brass was was uh, represents judgment. Uh, all the 60 pillars were made of wood, but they were covered in brass, and the tops of them had these shapirs or caps on them, which represent silver. Silver always represents reconciliation, meaning that the debt of your sins has been paid through the sacrifice of the atonement of the animals that you brought that will be laid on this brazen altar. And that brazen altar was made of chittim wood. And then the altar, this, this particular bowl, as it's called the lavier, was made also, but it, it had the, the, the brazen or the bronze that it was, or the brass, it had a, a, a sheen to it, a shine to it, and the women could polish it, and, and the better pieces of it, they could see themselves. But in heaven, in Revelations, I'll show you later on, that the sea of glass, where God says he sit on the, the, the Jesus said the right hand of God, and the angels of God, and the cherubims, the cherubims are singing, holy, 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 and the Lord says he looks and he sees the sea of glass. It represents being able to see through the eyes of God all over the world. It's, it's Ezekiel telling us that God sees everything. The cherubims had eyes all about them. It was the presence of God. The beast, the cherubims represent the presence of God. Hallelujah. So you had to get washed and clean and baptized, washed, washed in this lavier. So all of these symbols tie us back to the New Testament, actually lead us into the New Testament. And so I want to also point out that Jesus in the first court, the outer court, was the place of this brazen altar that I just mentioned to you. And I'm just highlighting it again because uh, I'm working from a different book and some of my stuff is not the same. He is the way, the truth, and the light. So you're entering in at the east gate, symbolic of the feet of Jesus. Amen. So I want you to catch that. That's the feet of Jesus that you're entering into. And the number two, second point, the holy court had three pieces of furniture. And I just described those to you. The, the first was the uh, the pieces of the holy, uh, we're not going to go to the holy court today, uh, but I do want to tell you that what that represents, and we show that last week that represents the golden uh, uh, menorah or the candlestick, uh, as we refer to it as the, the golden, it, it represents the light of God, the presence of God. There was no other light in the holy court. So the holy court was a more sacred place. Only the priests could come in there, but they had to also put on uh, uh, clean garments before they could come in. Your prayers coming before God, surrendering at that place of the lavier is symbolic of, of you on a bended knee asking God to forgive you for your sins because you're bowed down or you're, you're asking God for forgiveness. So, so these symbols uh, actually have relevance to uh, illustrations. Uh, God says that the seed is a word. It's the imagination of his mind. It's the parables that God gives us, the seed, the word, to give help give explanation to examples of, of, of what the Bible is teaching us in relationship to these holy courts and, and your relationship of moving from an outer court to a new relationship in the inner court to the holy court to the to the holies of holies hallelujah and so the candlestick the menorah the table of showbread the bread of life as we call it and the uh, um, uh, the, the presence of god that showbread is sometimes referred to in your face amen but it was the presence of the spirit of god that showed up and fed them from heaven and the word of god is bread of life hallelujah god is bread of life the altar of incense is a place where you come to worship and we went through that last, that we, that's a place where you bow down and you pray and there's incense that are burning. The incense got there because they got crushed and the crushing represents Jesus. Hallelujah. But we'll get into all of that more and more as we keep going on. But every week you're going to hear me talking about it because it's so relevant to where we are in the world today because folks need to bow down and worship our God. Amen. For he's a God of our self. The candlestick, the light of God, the showbread symbolizes manna from heaven, the bread of life. 
life. I just shared that the deeper, uh, where you gain a deeper relationship by studying his word. Number three is intimacy with Jesus is rooted in your relationship of sacrifice in the Holy Court. Sacrifice meaning that you're no longer on the outer court. Because as we study and find out later on in the book of Revelation, that, that John doesn't, Jesus, God tells John that he's not even concerned about the outer court. He's only going to address the, the holy court and the holies of holies. Hallelujah. And so that we're going to understand the relationship of intimacy with Jesus through your prayer life, through Bible study, through meditation, through obedience to hear, for his sheep hear his voice. The, the, and your, your prayers become a sweet smell uh, as you worship and adore him. Adore him is adoration, is giving God praise. It's, it's, it's part of your prayer life. Acts is an adoration. It includes praising. It's not asking anything. It's thanking God for all that he's doing because he's sovereign and he's powerful. Let me slow down just a little bit. I get happy. <laughs> and so the intimacy with Jesus is where I hope that you, you get to a place where you come and the Holy Spirit says, may I not know how to pray except the unction of the Holy Spirit. Know not what to pray. Know not what to pray without the unction of the Holy Spirit. Notice what it says here. It says, number three, intimacy is rooted in your relationship, in your relationship, hallelujah, in your relationship of prayer. And so in this relationship, the, the covering of the glory Glory of God in your life is rooted in your time spent in sacrificing. Give yourself as a living sacrifice and not in the holy court, but the holy court is in you. The meeting place is in you. That's your prayer closet in you. You, you are a walking tabernacle. You are you meeting God whenever you want to. Right with you are to call on the pastor, the priest, nobody. You call on Jesus. Call on God Almighty. Hallelujah. So the the the, the Acts of confession, see, for confessing. So we come to confess our sin. That's what the atonement was. We're coming to get and ask God for forgiveness. That's what the sacrifice was all about. And so the confession means that I'm coming to give myself and I'm confessing God that I, I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You may not have murdered nobody, but you may be thinking about it. You, you may not have cut somebody out, but you're thinking about it. You may not have stole it, but you're thinking about it. Maybe you did it already. But God is a God that can turn you around. But there are consequences to your action. But when you have Christ in your life as a center of the foundation, and, 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 and Bible study is a foundation of your life, and, and prayer is the foundation of the church, hallelujah, and people start getting saved, not because of the baptism of the water, uh, because it got in the pool, but it's the relationship of the Holy Ghost. It's the fire of God that swells up on the inside of you. It's a quickening. See, see, Jesus was the Messiah. He's the anointed one. So when he touched you with his spirit, it brought forth the newness of life that the old man has passed away and you become a new. That's what all this represents. <laughs> Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. The word is true. And it's the righteous of God. And he's the light. But Jesus is everything. He's love. He's joy. He's peace. He's a warrior. Hallelujah. He's a commander of chief in the, in the army. <laughs> you want to go to war? Have a prayer relationship with God. Glory to God. And so now I want to take you to the video. <laughs> Y'all bear with me just a minute. We're going to stop that share and go to the video. Um, um, glory to God. And, and this is going to show you what the actual tent, what, what I just described to you. This is a place called Timna Park in Israel. And these two persons, uh, Sergio and Rhoda, who are in Israel, are doing uh, a, a survey. They're, they're, they're going around examining, doing studies. Of, uh, and I didn't get a chance to research what their backgrounds are, but I, I want you to see um, this video. I'm trying to pull it up right now. Hallelujah. Can everybody see that? Up oh, and they get. Yes, we can see oh, it. You think, what were you thinking running out there? You're not trained for this. Oh. 
For our last and final stop today, we are heading to a very unique attraction. When I read the book of Exodus, I always imagined that because of millions of Israelites going through the desert, that the tabernacle would have been very, very large. It would have been giant. So the priests would be able to perform their Levitical duties. This tent is actually built according to the exact size given by God himself to Moses, as it is written in the book of Exodus. The size in the Bible is given in ancient biblical cubit measurement, and most scholars agree that it should be around 75 feet wide and 150 feet long. And now that we're here and I'm seeing the life-size tabernacle, I can't believe my eyes. The tabernacle is not as giant as I always pictured it. It's actually more of a size of an Olympic pool. Because the people were a lot, but um, one of the words that reminds me of how much they have to carry, so that makes sense. If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Of course, they needed to take it down, carry it in the desert, and put it back up. It just wouldn't make sense to build something the size of a Herod's second temple and then keep on taking it down and putting it back up while in the desert. I've just never given it proper thought, and I'm so glad that I can see it now. So the next time I read the text in Exodus account, I'm properly able to imagine how it looked like. So the visual always gives that benefit, and I'm so glad I was able to see this. It's awesome. Walking into the sand, seeing the artifacts, touching them, it does help me understand of the physical specifications that God instructed the Israelites to build, but it doesn't explain why. Why is the veil there? Why was it blue, purple, and scarlet? Why did God instruct to have bread on the table at all times? Why were there two cherubim on the ark? God gave so many meticulous details, and they all have very important purpose and great symbolism. In Exodus chapter 40, God instructed Moses the exact order in which this tabernacle should be set up every time they take it down and move it to a new place. And the order was pretty simple. After the Ark of the Covenant and the veil was in place, they were to put the table of showbread, then the menorah, then the screen door to the tent. And here is what's striking. In the book of John, Jesus proclaimed himself in the exact same order that matches these elements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. It's an incredible match, but it doesn't stop here. There are seven I am proclamations, and they all follow the exact same pattern as the tabernacle setup. And the thing is, Jesus did not say these things in one sentence. Between each I am, there was days, months. And when John wrote them down, it's also not in the same verse. It's spread out through chapters. And so this order was there, but as far as we know, nobody's ever found it before. This is very recent. This was found just a couple of years ago. So this means this pattern couldn't have been contrived. And it means that it could have not been there by chance. So if you're interested to know more about the tabernacle, its significance and the symbolism, you should watch this study by Charlie Garrett. The link is in the description of this video below. I have heard that this place has a press corner where you can fill out a box. Amen, amen, amen. I what just, you I wanted you all to, 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 to uh, visualize what that looked like. Uh, and that's modern time. And, and so if you turn to page uh, 70, page 70 in your book, um, if you have your Bible, you have a um, uh, new living Bible, uh, it turns the uh, cubic feet into uh, square feet. And it gives exactly the measurements that he just talked about that's in the Bible. 
Uh, and so if you look at Exodus, and that's why I wanted us to, 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 to make sure that people know that we're teaching this out of the Old Testament. And I don't use just the New Testament, I mean the uh, King James, but I use several different um, um, uh, Bibles. But here, this is out of uh, the New Living Translation because it broke that down so it simplifies for us to be able to see um, uh, the message and the teaching of, of what I wanted to present to you today. Uh, but I, I just wanted to make sure that you all saw this because it was important for me that, that you understand that, that in Exodus 27, he, he described it. This is 2022. And, and, and he is traveling in Israel with his wife, uh, I believe it's his wife, and, and they're given a physical illustration of the actual size. And when you think about 150 feet, it sounds like a lot of, uh, of footage, but it's really not. And so it says the acacia wood. The other word for acacia is shittim wood. Shittim wood is a, is a very dense wood. Uh, I use the word acacia uh, because that's the, the and, and it's found in, in the uh, country of Africa, uh, on the continent of, of Africa. It's in a dry places, um, but it's a real strong, uh, there, there, there's a fruit I can't remember that grows off of it. Uh, giraffe um, go to that particular tree, acacia wood, and because of what's growing up, because of the height and the thickness of the tree that they can, and the height of the giraffe, they, they feed off of it. And but 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 this, and understand acacia wood made a square altar seven and a half feet by and seven and a half feet long. And, and so we have this burnt altar. This is the altar. The size of the altar is not that big, seven feet. And so I just wanted to point these things. I'm not going to read the whole scripture. Later on down in verse, uh, uh, so Moses is given these instructions. Notice again that the overlay altar, is it, it has horns. Again, the horns point in each direction, north, south, east, and west. That covers the breath of God, the depth of God that covers the four corners of the world, the blood of Jesus covers the world, the, the propitiation of the sin that he did, the, the debt he paid uh, for uh, our sins and reconciled us back uh, to a gift of, of, of what we call salvation. Amen. And so the horns on each corner are also um, are made of bronze. And again, bronze will always represent judgment. And so God is the judge. Jesus is at the right hand and he becomes the judge through God Almighty because he is God. Amen. And so we have here this uh, a great brazen altar, but all the, the shovels, the basins, everything that was needed were given clear instructions throughout the Bible uh, that you read in the book of Exodus. Go down to verse nine and it talks to us about the plans of the courtyard. And so when in 27, Exodus 27 and nine, we begin to read that the courtyard of the tabernacle enclosed curtains made from fine linen on the south and the north. It represents 150 feet in each direction, north and south. And so that's, that's, that's what that is. That's 150 feet. And they will be held up by 20 bronze posts. And so the posts weren't bronze, they were covered with bronze. So the wood was the, was the shittim or acacia, acacia wood. Acacia wood is the wood that I told you a few minutes ago, that's this real thick, dense wood. Uh, later on, there were some, some references I saw that referred to, to the stubbornness of humans, of mankind. And so the, the, uh, this, this, this uh, 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 building of the outer court was, in, was set up as a place of holy place that the sacrifice for the atonement of sin was brought. I want you to understand in your walk with God through Christ Jesus, that entering into, when you confess Jesus, you're entering from a, out of this dark world that we live in. And you notice that the curtains were made of fine linen and they were white. So stepping into the, the, to the outer court, represents you uh, coming out of the sin nature 
where you're practicing sin. We, we are born into sin, but God has cleansed us through Christ Jesus of the blood when you confess believing in your heart, letting it come out of your mouth, the meditation of your heart be acceptable to God. So even though you say it, if it ain't down in your heart to believe it, you got to believe in the power of God's word. So everything that we're sharing with you is connected to Jesus. It's the foreshadowing of the coming of the physical Jesus, but God is the presence of Jesus in the spirit. <laughs> He's the triune God. Glory, glory. And so now, now that's one more point I want to point out. The east end of the court was 75 and the west side of the court was 75 feet long. So there was 150 feet on the north and south and 75 feet on the west end and 75 feet on the east end. And remember, the east end had the entrance as the only entrance into the holy court. Amen. Or excuse me, the outer court. But that was a sacred ground. That's where you brought your sacrifice. That's where you first meet your Jesus. Hallelujah. That's where you met my, my Jesus is in the outer court where you decide to give your life to Jesus. I'm, see, see, last week, my sister that you see up here, Sister Willa May, she asked me a question. And, and it made me really think I got to I got to I got to teach better. Hallelujah. Because she said, tell me about this toolbox that you talk about. See, the toolbox is, is when you go to work and, and you go to your desk, your, some of you have a computer, that's your toolbox. Some of you, uh, your computer is your toolbox or the printing machine. Or uh, if you work at the cashier, you, you, you're working at the cashier and you, 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 you're taking money, you're typing in how much the cost and you're registering, you're doing all that to check people out so you can buy their grocery. That, that's part of your toolbox. But I ain't talking about that kind of toolbox. If you're a carpenter, you got some tools. If, if, you, if you're dealing with copper and bronze or if you're a welder, you got some tools. Everybody got some tools. But I'm talking about spiritual tools. These are symbolic. And you made me think. To, to begin to think all week long about the tools. And the meditation of my heart is acceptable, is a tool. <laughs> the scripture becomes a tool. The, the understanding and having a relationship in my prayer life, in your prayer life with God is my tool. Hiding under the shadow of my wings, of God's wings is a tool. It's in my toolbox. Is that, so, so uh, the love that you have uh, brothers and sisters of Christ, to be on this class, to sacrifice. You're willing to make a sacrifice. That's in your toolbox. You, you, you have made specific time at two o'clock to be on this class. Hallelujah. That's, a, that's in your tool. In other words, things that you really need. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you really need this. So it's, it's, you're not needing Anton Seals. You, you need the word, the word, the word of God. And so the, the, the toolboxes, in, in your toolboxes, it's Jesus. He's holding you. He comforts you when you feel like you can't go on. <laughs> yes, yes. He, he renews you when you get sick and you, and you feel like you're dying I, and, and, and you can't go on. But there's something in you. It's a spirit. It ain't a tool. It ain't no mustard seed. It's the spirit of God. <laughs> Sister, sister, uh, brother, brother, uh, 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 Clarence, Clarence is, is, is a man of God. He works and he's at work. And I talk to him in the morning on prayer. He's, he's just getting home or he's going to sleep or he's getting up and going back to work. He's at work, but he takes time out to sacrifice, sacrifice to, to study God's word. God puts people together. Holly Stan Neville's it's how God gave you a toolbox to learn how to invest and to own properties and to be able to give wisdom to people, to encourage them about their health and then learning more. That's in your toolbox, a desire to know more. Amen. Because that's what keeps us living. So the toolbox is being able to trust God when you can't figure it out. Amen. So thank you for stretching me because I, I listed things that were just for me. But as an instructor, I got to help you see how this word mm -hmm, in the outer court, inner court, or holy, you can't get to Jesus without the, the first 
First, every day you got to come to him, our Father who art in heaven, hallow be thy name. In other words, hollow me out, empty me out, strip me, Jesus, I bow down and I work. That's what prayer does for you. Amen. You, you, you can't grab hold of no electrical power line and, and a generator without some protection. And so God represents all power. And he's clothed in, in the humanity of Jesus so we could touch and see him through Christ Jesus. <laughs> and then he said, I'll put my spirit down on the inside of you because I made you in my image and my likeness. And that's why I called you the meeting place. Oh, glory, glory. Tell Emma she need to come on get in this class. Come on back, Emma. I need you. Sister Emma, Emma Scott, I need you back in this class. Sister Charlie Mae, I need y'all back. I need people to come on and join us and get some of this. This is, I told my prayer partner, Fred Brackett, and, and there's a sidebar to entering into from a state of being in the outer court and you, your mind is so messed up and so frustrated. And then you start praying. And I told him, I said, man, when we get to praying sometime, and we had an experience of prayer when he was in the hospital, and we were, I was reading the Bible to him. And the Holy Ghost, this, this man's Bible, he had notes everywhere. And I just took it and started reading. He was in rehab, and he fell asleep. And he called me today and said, Seals, that was years ago. And I still remember how the, I heard, the, I literally heard the voice of God come through that book that you were reading called the Bible. It wasn't me. It wasn't you. We're his vessels. And when you're in that place, you don't know how God will use you to be a blessing of encouragement for somebody else. Amen? So, so the word, I said, brother, we had some peanut butter and some jelly. He said he tasted see. <laughs> Is he not good? Yay, glory. He's out of rehab. He's been walking around for years. Hallelujah. Praising God. He has a street ministry. He, he goes to places that most of us would never even think of. So let me get back into the lesson. But this is all part of the lesson. This doesn't have to be in my notes for me to help you to understand. I want to I wanna point out something to you. As you can go check this out later. In Exodus 40, if you go there real quick, those of you that are online with me, go to Exodus 40 and 8. I, I want to show you the relationship of, of this text and this lesson on the outer court and how it so affects us today. It is so profound. That, that's, that's why Brother Randall's not here, and I love Brother Randall Poindexter because uh, he's always been so encouraging to me as well. When I didn't have a, a laptop, uh, I don't have one now, but, but uh, he, he brought me a rebuilt laptop, and it worked for two or three years. Then when, when it went out, he said, Brasils, you got to get a new one. Let's go to Exodus 40 and 8. And I'm going to read more than just that, but uh, who's got that Bible open? Anybody got that Bible open? 40 and 8. I just need somebody. I got 33 up here, but yeah, verse 8. And thou shalt set up the court around the Bible and hang up the hangings. Now, in, the, in Exodus 40, we're at the end part of where God has given Moses all the instructions from uh, chapter 27, and, and they're now traveling out of, out of Egypt, and they're in the, in the desert. They've been traveling, and they're, they're carrying the, the Ark of the Covenant. And, and God tells them to, to, no, they haven't been covering yet. So God tells Moses, listen to this. Thou shalt set up the court around about, hang up the hangings of the court. And he, he reared up the court around about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hangings of the court gate. So Moses finished all the work. Everything was ready. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. Mm -hmm. The Shekinah glory, the weight of his glory. Uh, the, it's called the, 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 the paraclete is the Holy Ghost. But this is the presence of God. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Can you imagine having a relationship with God where he feels your presence? You enter into, he sits you in a heavenly place. That's in your prayer life. And you can get to a place they don't care what's going on in your mind. You got a relationship with God. 
in front of every tear. I've been there. Been on the deathbed. Scared to death that I was going to die. 30 years old, had to have lung surgery. Never been sick a day in my life. Like, nothing like that. And I had an encounter with Jesus. And so, so Moses had finished the work and the cloud covered. Verse 35, Moses was not able to enter. There comes a place in your relationship that all you can do is bow down and worship. Have you ever been in a church service and experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit there that fills the tabernacle where the, the, the uh, and we talked about this in the in the class before, the God chaser, and we talked about it in, in teaching on faith and in and, and the walk with disciples, that there's a relationship with God that, that you can't do nothing but bow down and worship him and, and sometimes he overflow with tears. But he said that they couldn't enter in because the cloud abode around them. The glory filled the tabernacle. I, I want the glory to fill your homes right now. I, I want the glory to fill you up and heal your body right now. I, I want you to be restored in the name of Jesus. That's what this lesson is all about. The power of God, Sister Evangelist Crew, that, that you weep no more, that the strength and the power of God is moving because he's answered your prayers and turned your family around. <laughs> Glory. That, that's that's what I'm talking about. Power. Amen. Power. Amen. Brother Stanley Neville's the power to know that God, three years ago when I met you, you, you weren't even able to walk. But the power of God by your faith to believe is the same as God that's in Exodus 40 is with us today. And the cloud was taken up. And the Israels went on with see, 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 when 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 we praise God. You should keep following them. Don't, don't, don't just go back to the normal stuff because then you're caught up in the world. Salvation means to be separated. The court was separated from the outer court. Ah, uh, the confession's made with your mouth. You can go to Romans 10 and 9 through 10. Confess believing and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is the son of the living God. That he died and he rose on the third day. By grace you are saved. Ah, not by faith, but it's by the faith to believe in the power of his word. But it's the grace of God. It's the power of God. It's the presence of God. Amen. So I just wanted to pull a little bit of that out to today to help us to understand where we're going in the outer court as we enter into the uh, to enter into this outer court, confessing with your mouth, believing. In one's heart, God raised Jesus from the dead and that he took ordinary people, ordinary people, amen, to do the will of God. And so I want you to go to page 71. I just want to point out some things on page 71, and I'm going to, I'm going to go to the book. I got it. I'm going to put that on the screen so people can see that. I, I know that people want to see my face. I, I, we're going to have a new camera in another week or so. I may have to call on some people to help me make sure we get set up right. But, but God makes a way. God makes a way. So when you hear me asking, this computer, somebody sold it to us. And we bought a new computer. Somebody gave us the money. And the printer, someone gave us the money. Right? Amen. The camera that's up here, someone... All the stuff that's going on, God is making a way. I'm 71 years old. I'm, I, am, I am determined to live my life for Jesus. What about you? I'm determined to have a closer walk with God. What about you? On, on page 71, I, I want to point out some things. Uh, the circumference again and the feet we talked about. We talked about the 20 pillars. We talked about the, the, the actually 60 pillars. The 60 pillars of the outer court reference the 60 men who aligned in the bloodline with Jesus. Uh, the genealogy uh, leading to Jesus has been documented in Matthew uh, 1. This is for those who who want to do some more Bible study? If you if you'd like to have this information, you can buy the book on on ebook for nine ninety nine. Hey Amen. Nine ninety nine. It's 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 this huge book, but it's two hundred fifty four pages. But but get it. Uh, I sent it to you, Brother Stanley. I don't know if you opened it up, and Sister Jeanette. I think I sent you the book as well. Uh, and look on your ebook. Look on your email. I, I believe I sent it to both of you all. And to, to Clarence, I think I sent it to you too, Clarence. So 
uh, um, it is shareable. But so Matthew 1, 1 through 16, Matthew 1, 1 through 16, another scripture, Luke 3, uh, 23, 38, all of them describe the genealogy of, of Jesus from Old Testament through the New Testament, through the lines of David. Amen. And so the, I did a study on Jesus out of uh, uh, the book of uh, Matthew, uh, out of the book of Luke. It's powerful. That's another class we'll teach later. Amen. The 60 brass pillars had brass sockets and silver fillets or fillets. Uh, the, 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 these were the stabilizing. See, the, 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 the pillars were thick. And they had cords that were anchored. You know, when you get a tent, you anchor to the ground. This represents the pillars of you. You got a pillar. You've been judged. That's that's brass. That's the bronze. That's your sin nature. That God called you out of. He cleaned you up. The Hebrew boys, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they, they had a purging experience in the fire. It was, a, it was a living example of the presence of God that covered them with his glory, with his presence, by, by the power of just his being. They said, I, I thought we put three men in there. There were four. He said, well, there's four in there. There's one walking around. He had brass feet. That was, that was Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, so the, this also points to the strength and stability of who you become when you have a relationship in prayer, when you have a relationship in studying the word, when you have a relationship and not just reading it, but living it, because it becomes a living word in you. I don't want you to pray. I want a life of prayer. I'm, I'm believing for the manifestation of miracles and signs and wonders that we pray for people on the line, that the voice of God will move, the spirit of the living God will move to draw people, lift up the name of Jesus. He'll draw all men unto him, Lord, but heal and deliver, save and sanctify, protect and God, snatch our children out of the branding. Our, that's what's missing in the world. That's what this book is all about. People laugh at me. That's all he want to talk about. You a tabernacle. Do you not know who you really are? That you are the chosen of God, the elect of God. It's just a title, but it's more than a title. It's relationship. It's intimacy. I can have a relationship with this bottle in the car. I'm in love with my water, but it ain't going to save me. If, if, if I need it now, you can't go too far too long without no water. But we got folks that live their whole life, drink a whole lot of water, Ain't got no Holy Ghost, been in church all their life and don't know Jesus, don't know who they are in Jesus. And that's what I want to keep trying to get you to hear, that the blood from the unblemished sacrifice is you. Hallelujah. To believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead is the same God that healed you and brought you off that sick bed. Same God that stopped your child and, and, and others from committing suicide. Right now, God, release your spirit that our children stop committing suicide and this murderous spirit in the atmosphere. Let's go to page 72. And we're still in the outer court. I knew I knew that we weren't going to get through all this. And so I, I talked about the, the 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 silver and the gold. The silver represents. And we're going to get what you hear me listing about the different metals. There were three metals that were used. Three metals. Brass represents judgment. Silver represents what? Reconciliation. It represents Jesus reconciling. The debt, the debt of your of your sin, Amen. He cancels it out, and so so we have gold, which represents the deity, the purity, the holiness, the sovereignty of God, Amen. Uh, the, the silver again is 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 redemption, and brass always represents reflection of judgment. Every day you're, you're being judged by God. Every day, if you're not careful, your mind will start judging people and that becomes so judgmental that you love God, but you hate everything and everybody around you that don't look like you. That ain't God. 
we go to church and we love God, but I can't stand this person sitting next to me. They need to lose some weight. No, you need to change your spirit. You need deliverance. <laughs> That's what this is all about. Get into a new relationship. Okay, how much Bible study you have? If you don't have intimacy and understand the spirit of this word, you're missing something. That's like talking about I got a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Ain't no peanut butter. Ain't, ain't no bread. <laughs> <laughs> you ever get hungry and didn't have no meat and all you had was some mayonnaise? <laughs> I certainly have. Yes, yeah, yeah. You had yeah. a spoon and a jar of peanut butter, and that's all you did have. That's right. That's all you had. You wanted to make some iced tea and you didn't have no, you had no sugar. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yeah, see, see, it's stuff you don't know that you have to go through. Okay, let's go. But so the making of the tabernacle and, and the gold furniture and the objects and the utensils, all this represents the coming of Jesus, the purging of your sins, deliverance, amen, redemption. So when people say salvation is free, <laughs> it costs, <laughs> yeah, it's free to to receive it, but you got to walk this back fella to keep it, and that ain't free. <laughs> so to all you people out here that think salvation is free, it is free for you to receive, but it's your responsibility to walk after the hands of God, the way of God, and stay on the straight and narrow path and, and have a mind that's made up, a mind that's, that's, that has that says, let this mind that be in Christ also be in you. That, that, that this crown, this helmet of salvation is a mind that's made up, that, that, that the enmity of my natural man is subject to the spirit of the Holy Ghost, to the shepherd's voice of Jesus, uh -huh. to the living word that comes out of this Bible. That's where we are. So the, the, the presence of God, Jesus, Son of God, was covered with earthly flesh to hide his deity. This flesh covers the spirit of God in you, and, and but God put his spirit in you because he sent you in this world at a specific time with a specific purpose, the same way he did uh, 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 Baziel and Aolahab, uh, who were responsible for helping to build all that was constructed as instructed by Moses, because God told Moses who to call. So when we're calling you and you accept the call to serve in the house of God, you got a divine assignment. If you're the usher, you got a divine assignment. If you're the dishwasher, you got an assignment to do it. I washed dishes for years in the church and didn't understand that he was preparing me to wash them dishes. Humbled me because they put me around some older men that began to tell me, Brother says, you think you slick. We know what you're doing, brother. We know you up here talking about you love Jesus, but you tipping. You got you need to change that, man. You got you can't you can't you can't sit on the fence. Come all the way with Jesus. Brothers, I'm saying some things to us, brothers and sisters, about this word and deliverance. So I didn't want to just teach you about the tabernacle and not make it applicable to you, not to challenge you to listen that, that you have all that you have because God, every good gift that you have comes from God and you won't, you won't sow a seed to, to, to nothing but we'll spend millions and thousands of dollars outside of our community and wonder why our community looked the way. We know, we know all the stuff that goes on. But we got to do better by, for ourselves. Give God, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together. God doesn't demand anything. He's, he lays it out and tells you what you need to do. My mother didn't, she didn't have to demand nothing. She told us what was expected. The demand came when you started acting crazy and didn't do what she told you to do. <laughs> it's went upside your head. We live in a world now that you, your children can cuss you out and you hit them and they call the police, you go to jail. What kind of craziness is going on in the world? Because we've removed God out of our homes. Amen. So, so, so this lesson, this lesson, three types of metals, I mentioned that, the brass, the silver, and the gold.
As we go to page 73 uh, in, your, in your outline that I gave you, I'm just picking out some things today because I knew I, I can't get to everything. But I want to point out some things on page uh, 73. Gold was used throughout the holy court. So, so we know we talked about the, uh, the outer court and brass, silver on the caps, silver on the hooks. It represents reconciliation. Brass is the judgment. I want to point out some things, and I was flowing with this the way that it's written uh, throughout the text. Um, and so silver was always used with brass, but gold and gold as connecting for let's for it had the redemption power, but that was always on the inside court. That was never on the outer court. Amen. The brass, the bass claps, the hooks were used at the outer court, making the bronze altar of the sacrifice, the sacrifice laid, or the bronze lavier. The gold hooks and the tachets or tashes were used only at the holy court and the holy is holy. That was on the inner uh, holy court. We'll show you some pictures later. We're going to get into more depth. Every, every lesson, we'll see more pictures. And if you study the book, you'll see the pictures. Amen. We already show videos. I'm going to show some more videos. We're going to show some more pictures. Uh, but right now, I'm just teaching out of the book. And so you may not, may not see. Uh, let me go to the book so some of you that are listening can actually see it. Let me see if I can pull that up for you. Uh, glory to God. Let's go back to that share. Amen. Forgive me. I, I sometimes get so caught up, I forget to, to share what I'm doing. Hey, glory to God. I got to get better with that. I always correct myself and try to, to, to recognize where I need to do better. Um, because I want I just want to do the best I can to help people to understand the power of God in our lives on page 73. This is where I am. I want to point these points out to you. And so people um, who, are, who may be looking at this on, um, uh, this should be on your screen. Can you see this? Okay, just wave your hand if you can see it, uh, Sister uh, Willamay. Thank you. Thank you, Sister uh, Evans Jeanette. Thank you. And so gold, gold, gold was used throughout the Holy Court. The 48 pillars used in the holy court were made of the same wood, the acacia wood or the shittim wood, acacia wood covered with gold. Gold, again, purity, deity of God, the holiness of God. And, and so in the holy court, we have three pieces of furniture, the gold, the, the gold menorah, the candlestick that was made from 75 pounds of gold. <laughs> Step, they, they, they beat it, they melted it, and then shaped it into, into 75 pounds of, of gold that was made to make the candlestick that represents the seven churches, that, that represents the oil and the light, and the candlestick was the light, then had no light switch. And so the, the showbread, the candle, and also... The third piece of furniture is the golden uh, altar of prayer where the incense were that was like three feet uh, in front of the, the veil. And at this time, the veil had not been rent. This was the place that only the high priest could go to. And so the golden uh, uh, candlestick, 75 pounds of pure gold, was hammered into this form. The Ark of the Covenant was made also of acacia wood, and it was cut. It was hollowed out so that it was cleaned out, and then they covered it with gold. Boy, they had to, they, you had to have some, so, you know, didn't have no furnace like we have today. So the ingenuity of, of people back then to make fire hot enough to melt gold and then have the skills. They didn't have no asbestos gloves. So they had some kind of installation because they were dealing with hot material. The, the cherubims, as you know, were, were also, uh, uh, we'll find on the curtain, the linen curtains all around the inside of the holy court. You didn't see them on the outside court. You didn't even, as you go into the holy court, you didn't see uh, the, the, the insignias of the cherubims that, that, uh, uh, sewn into that curtain. But on the other side, you would see it on the inside of the holy court because it represents being in a holy place with God. 
And so that's what your prayer life enters you into a more holy relationship with God. And so he begins to change your character and your behavior and your mindset. And so the cherubim, the veiling, the veil, separating the holy and the holies from the ceiling down. So the tabernacle entrance was also made with uh, this fine linen. And as I said to you, there was no appearance at that time of on the outside of, of the cherubim, of, of the cherubim on the, on the uh, coverings. Uh, the 50 gold claps or the hooks um, connected to the 10 blue sheets. And, and last two sheets, five on each side, made with loops on each side, denoting again the deity of God. The 50 loops on each side, there was 100 of them, with claps, connected 10 sheets, which was covering the tabernacle. One of the things we're going to find out as we go into this, is that there were three layers of covers over the holy court. <laughs> and each one of them was, was tied down. And we're going to talk about what those colors um, you heard in the video that we showed that um, 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 the, the young man was saying that, uh, uh, that that he was wondering why that certain colors we're going to we're going to get into that next week and more and more to understand what these colors actually represent. The fifty also represents the Pentecost. The, the Pentecost, a free will offering, uh, is it, not a sin offering. This was this was a Greek word meaning fiftieth also known as a peace offering. It's part of the harvest feast. Um, there's another Jewish term, and I can't think of it, but I'll get it for you for next week. Um, but, but, but it represents every 50th year. Every 50th year, there was a special feast. Silver was used, and is the second of the three metals designating again reconciliation. Silver was for the atonement and redemption of our sins of all mankind. You can go to Matthew 27 and look at that. That's down here at the bottom of the screen. Silver. So what, what, I, what I tried to do is, is to, to now show you here, uh, silver was used in these three metals and, and it shows atonement. Jesus is betrayed and purchased for 30 pieces of silver. Silver is connecting the rods and the symbolettes, so symbolizing, stabilizing the, the linens and hanging of the curtains. This is the strength of righteousness being upheld by the power of God, and it's pointing to Jesus, but it's also reflecting to you. It's also in your relationship of, of giving you a steadiness. When we talk about standing on a, a solid rock, it's the rock of Jesus, so that you become that foundation, a sure foundation. God instructed Moses to give a half a shekel of silver to every person over 20. And so the silver, the, the caps were also on top of each pole, representing that we knew that the poles were there to anchor, but you were covered by the presence of the Spirit of God who was reconciling you for your sins when you brought your animals, when you bring your prayers, when you, when you bring your petitions, you're asking God to cover you. Whew. He already said it, I would. <laughs> so we're just operating on what he told us. And this, this becomes alive for me. The brass speaks of the sin nature of man. Here I'm down here uh, on number four. The brass, the brass, the brass. I, I'm going to use a, a different color on this one. The brass, the brass, okay. The brass, uh huh. The brass. It's a brownish color. Represents sin found in the outer court of the brazen lavier, in the outer court of the brazen altar, the tabernacle coverings in the outer court. <laughs> Hallelujah. And and notice notice here the brass represents. I will check this out. Let, let's go back to here for just a moment. Where, where it says that, 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 that the brass represents Jesus standing in the midst of the candlestick. <laughs> Why he said it, Brazil? Because it said in the Bible that his feet were as brass. Revelations 1 and 15 denotes Jesus as the high priest, unlike none other. My, my, my. All my life, I have heard Pastor uh, Elder Seals that the brass meant that, we, that Jesus was black. 
<laughs> have you ever well, heard that? Have you ever yes heard that? Yes, I have. They used to teach uh, that, that all the that, time. That means he that was is, black. That's the only thing they had reference to the, the saying that Jesus was black. Well, well, I mean, it, it is was, quite... uh, now we we saying now now I'm, I'm seeing the teaching that now that uh, that was just because he was standing in the in the in the uh, midst of the candlestick. Well, but but what it what it also represents is that the, the truth of the matter is um, you have to understand in the Middle East where where in in Africa everybody uh, was dark, black. It, it, people were dark. Yeah, yeah, very dark. I I I know that too. <laughs> so okay. yeah, wool yeah, wool hair. <laughs> and I I went to Israel with the church I, and I saw that for myself. Amen. And so Amen. one of the things that that. If color doesn't matter, no, it doesn't. Not, not but it does. Because if it didn't matter, then you see more black Jesus is on the cross. You'd see more African Americans in the studies of the Bible. There will be no problem being able to own up. If we love God, then we should be able to talk about the sins of the world. That man has, has persecuted one another and misused God's word and his power. See, God gave us dominion due to his power. He didn't give it to us to, to abuse people. No, I know. Yeah, I, I know you know because you, you've been teaching this. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you know. But I'm talking about those that don't know. Mm -hmm. that, that the power wasn't given to us to step down on people. To, to don't want you to talk about the race hatred in America, but it's real. Oh, yes. I was beat up by white people, me and my grandmother in, in Tennessee. We were beat up by five white men and, and one white lady. It broke I, my I grandmother's that. back. And, and I, I was just five years old. So I know very well about racism. Well, I know that I've heard you share that in the, in the Sunday school classes that I attended with you and your husband, so your late husband. Uh, so I know that that's real. Yeah, I had a grandfather that that uh, lived to be 90 years old, 88 years old. And I'm 80. Um, and so um, I have an uncle's 99, 95. Um, and so the stories that have been shared with, with us need to be told. Yes. Uh, and we have people in our world today that don't want the truth. And they go to church just like you and I. Mm -hmm. And they don't like but they love Jesus. Yes. How about that? And go to church every day, every Sunday, eleven o'clock. But let's let's not make it a, just a race thing. We got black on black murders uh, because we've removed God out of our homes and out of our community. And so, when you're competing um, to spend time with God, and you'd rather watch uh, video games. And all kind of stuff that's on television, I mean, it, it really occupies your mind. And if you're not careful, you get consumed by it. So this picture, this picture of what I'm drawing for you is this, this presence of God is, is, yes, he was a man of color. Yes, he was. I believe he was black. I believe baby Jesus, it was black. If you go to Greece, you'll see the black Madonna. <laughs> so there's some truth to it. This was the same place that where David purchased. Now understand, let, let's look at, it says he, he was a completion of the covenant that God promised Abraham that his seed would be blessed. Again, there's a historical reference of the covenant between Abraham and the offering. And this is important to understand that you bring in your, your offering to God. You're not giving, you, God don't need your money. Giving tithes and offering as, as they were giving their offerings as sacrifice laid was, was a commitment to give back to God because he had been so good to them. And so they were bringing their offerings for the forgiveness of sin because it was, it was a covenant. It was the law. It was written. And that same word of, of the law of God, the spirit of God, didn't change when it says to give God your tithes and your offering. And, and that the, the, the ox is worthy of chewing in the cud that he, he, he treads in. In other words, he's eating of the ground that he works in. Priests and ministers, they're, they're worthy of their hire. And, and it's not my place to judge them. I pray that they're all doing the right things. 
But I, someone said, well, Brother Sears, you don't have a church, so why are you asking? Because I'm doing God's work. I'm doing God's work. I'm not begging nobody. I just, I just believe God will make a way. He will make a way. And so I'm showing you something here in this text that says, well, because of Abram's faith, where he laid up Isaac and was getting ready to stab his son and kill him because he was being obedient to the, to the direction that God had told him to offer his son as a living sacrifice. And at the moment, a ram was there in the bush. God always has a ram in the bush. There's always a way. Now, First Corinthians tells us that, that God allows us to go through, but he never puts more on us than we can handle. That's what the ram in the bush. There's always a way out. So this speaks to Jesus, who comes to reconcile our sins, to pay the debt. And he becomes the second of the third patriarch. And so, so what, what am I saying here? Uh, this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the patriarchs in the Bible. The location of where uh, 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 Abraham was giving the sacrifice. And well, what does that have to do with the, with, with, with the outer court? Because this is the same, uh, the same symbolism, the same illustration down through history of making the sacrifice. I want you to hear this, that the location of where a memorial was built, was a place of sacrifice to remind all that God sees and provides Jehovah Jireh. So they knew God as Jehovah Jireh, even in the desert. Even when they came up on the Red Sea, before he opened the Red Sea, he made a way out for them. There ain't nothing in this world that God can't deliver you from if he wants to deliver you. Especially if you continue, sometimes the good and the bad suffer together. The wheat and the tares. So it ain't always just about what goes on in your life. Is 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 where is your soul gonna wind up when you then this body runs out? When this tent has no more life left? When this physical body, the tent, this humanity is gone. My, I'm dead and gone. Where is my spirit going? Where is your spirit going, your soul? Where is your soul going? Hmm. This was the same place where David made a sacrifice on the threshing floor where he said, I will not offer to God uh, a sacrifice that costs me nothing. <laughs> this was the same place, the threshing floor of Ornan and uh, Arana, where uh, uh, I can't ever pronounce his name right, uh, Aranon, uh, to build an altar of sacrifice. He gave David the land to make a sacrifice. And, 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 he said, and David said to him, you can read this in Second, First Chronicles 21 and 18, uh, and, and Second Samuel 24, 18, that, that this is the same site for which Solomon builds God's tabernacle for the Ark of the Covenant. Woo there's a pattern, there's a plan that's so precise down through the years. You don't need the ark today. You, it's in you because he rent the veil. He put his spirit because it was already there. I made you in my likeness and my image. But when Jesus died and took all the sins of the world, he opened us up to receive him, to bring forth that spirit to quicken you. Genesis 22 and 11, and the angel of the Lord called down unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He said, here I am. And I want to say, Lord, here I am. <laughs> yes, I'm with you. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram in the bush, <laughs> a ram in the thicket. I want you to look around when you feel like that's the toolbox, Sister Willamie. When you, when you can't find your way out, be still and see the salvation. Or just by faith, believe just a little bit. See, the mustard seed, y'all, the mustard seed, the mustard seed. The mustard seed, um, by faith, the signs of mustard seed. You know mustard seed saved you. You know mustard seed saved not a soul. The mustard seed represents the illustration symbolically uh, an illustration, an example of how God's word comes alive by saying this little bitty seed 
is all you need and it will grow a huge, strong plant. That's the spirit of God. And as you mature in his word, as sure as his name is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as sure as he is God, the triune God, the stronger you, you get, the more you spend time with him, the older you get, the more time you spend with him. He's a God who forgives. When nobody else can understand you, no one else will love you, no one else can feel your heart. And when you fall in love with Jesus, he'll comfort you in the midnight hours. He'll strengthen you. This is who God is. The tabernacle of Moses, as we go to the next part of this, uh, my God, um, should I keep going or should I stop? And let's go five more minutes because we started late. Tabernacle of Moses is God's meeting place. This is, this is where you meet God. This is on page 74, I think. And so, so entering the outer court at the east gate is at the feet of Jesus. The word tabernacle, again, means to dwell. To, to have a prayer life means to commune. To commune means to dwell, to abode, to abide, to rest, to be in a place of a meeting place <laughs> with God. Let me move this camera thing over here. <laughs> it's a meeting place with God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was flesh, and Jesus came and dwelt amongst men, the tabernacle in you, his spirit, the spirit of God. When he met them in the upper room, when, when Jesus told them, wait here, for the imparting of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send my spirit, the Holy Spirit. I got to leave you so that the Holy Spirit can come to do the next part of what my Father has sent you, me to do. I want you to know that God wants to use you, that, that you represent the purity, that he said, be ye holy, for I am holy. Salvation is a lifelong process. <laughs> it's a journey. And that's why I said to you, it does cost you something because you have to, you, is your offering, is your sacrifice laid on the altar of sacrifice? Have you given up your time, talents, and treasures for the glory of God? Have you helped somebody as you pass along? Again, these white curtains represent the holiness of God. It represents the righteousness and the sinfulness, uh, uh, the sinlessness of the nature as we know it in the New Testament, at the grace of God. And the curtain represents the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus in his walk in humanity. And the white linen fabric on all four sides of the camp represents the presence and the holiness of God. Again, I keep symbolizing this. As the symbolism of Christ in his ministry, it, it represents the blood. It, re it represents the crucified, dying Jesus who trained the 12 disciples. You're his disciples. You're disciplined by the word of God to be obedient to the will of God. And so down here, it says there are four separate camps. I want to go back up to this alignment right here, uh, if you can see this. The alignment of the camps and the, uh, resemble the shape of the cross. That's so important to remember because I don't want you to forget that all this was about the relationship of the foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus that would not occur until thousands of years later in the New Testament. This foreshadowing of Christ surely points to the crucifixion because the camp was set in place as a cross. The, the tribes were set up by areas and they had certain responsibilities. And particularly the four tribes, the four tribes, the Levitical priest tribes that were each set on the north, south, east, and west of the around the holy court, they were closer to that because these were the priests of the Aaronic priests and the Levitical priests. And they were placed in closer proximity to the camp. And so, so this represents that God raised Jesus from the dead where sinners are saved and God's plan of salvation takes place. God, by his grace, imputes in Jesus, the high priest, the power to forgive sin. That's why he's our advocate. He sits on the right hand of God Almighty. 
there were also four separate camps composed of priests. So this, this, this daily traveling or weekly traveling or monthly travel, whatever the cloud moved, they moved. The encampment represents the appointed priestly order. There's an order in your life because you're called to be the priest. Then the center of this cross was a placement of a tabernacle. Huh. At the heart of it all is Jesus. At the heart of it all is the presence of God. I, I wonder, uh, I think I took it down. I did, I did, I took it down. Uh, I, had a, I had a picture of the fire coming down uh, in the video I just showed. Uh, the, next, the next video had a, I'll show it to you next week. Um, I'll show it to you next week. And so, so let's go down a little bit, entering to the gates of the outer court at the feet of Jesus. This will take us down to page 76. Uh, I'm going to finish this and then we'll close out. And, and so um, any questions from anybody? Any comments before we go forward? Wave your hand, shout something. <laughs> people say, well, since they don't talk. Well, um, the, I try to get people to talk. Entering the gate of the outer court at the feet of Jesus at the brazen altar, sacrificial offerings takes place. Sacrifices are lifted up before God. Represents cross of Jesus, the shed blood for the repentance. See, the shed blood means that you have to repent. Repent. You don't have to shed no blood. He just wants you to have a repentant heart. That, that means you cannot, repentance means to turn away from. Brothers and sisters in Christ and people that don't know Jesus, you cannot repent without God. You can say it, but unless you believe in God, through Christ Jesus, the way I'm taught, the Holy Spirit, the triune God, the Jesus that died on the cross, he even repented. He said, Father, forgive me. That was repentance. <laughs> In the garden of Gethsemane, where he was crushed with pain because he saw his death. The garden of Gethsemane is the place where the olives the olive oil, the olive trees, and olives represent the olives that made the oil, and you can't get no oil without no crush. You can't get no grape juice without crushing the grapes. Huh. We'll talk about that further. The, 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 at the brazen lavier where the priest would wash themselves, is, this, is your prayer life and prepper preparing you to enter into the presence of God from this, this outer world that we live in into the presence of God. The washing and the cleansing of the spirit of God as the washing is symbolized in the water of the lavier or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the baptismal pool represents that you're uh, outwardly saying to the world that I've accepted Jesus Christ and he's washing my sins away. But really without the Holy Ghost, ain't no, ain't no purification, ain't no cleansing, ain't no real salvation. Oh, no, only one that knows is Jesus and God, between you and God. Washing, uh, other people will know about your behavior though. You know, the, the fruit that you bear and, and the kind of, character you have will be revealed. Entering the holy court in its furniture, the colors of the curtains, the golden candlestick, the golden lamp, or the menorah represents the righteousness and the light of Christ. The light. He is the light of the world. The seven candlesticks are the seven stars in the right hand of Jesus. These are the angels. These are referred to as the pastors of the seven churches. His redeeming power is what entering into the holy court is that, Lord, I'm coming to you because I need you, because I love you, because I adore you, because I magnify you, because I know that you are the God that reconciled me, that healed me, that delivered me, that protects me, that you're my Jehovah Jireh, you're my provider, you're my way maker. So, Lord, I want to walk by the light of God. Let your light shine, children of God, people of God. You're the candle of the Lord. You need some oil. You need some refreshing. You need to be in the presence of God because you are a spiritual creature. You're a creature, creature meaning a human being created <laughs> by God. Creation to be transformed by the Holy Spirit that's in you. 
which is the presence of God, the anointed one, Jesus. The table of the showbread represents the 12 tribes, 12 loaves. Each, each tribe was represented. Each tribe was eating from the manna from heaven. They were being fed down the, the word of God, the presence of God. He was meeting their need. They asked for food. He gave bread from heaven, manna. You could only take so much of it. It was representing the, the substance, the bread of life for eating, the fellowship, the dining, the supping. It meant that I, as I eat, let me remember, bless Father, for, uh, what is it, what is it? Uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Ha, ah, that's my, that's the Lord's prayer. Let's bless this food. We thank you, Lord. And so, so we go on to the entrance to the golden altar of incense, consecrated, anointed by special. We're going to get into that. There's a whole section in this book about the, the oils and the mixtures of the, of the herbs and, and what they represent and the smells and how they, how they were cut down off the trees and brought out, out of the, uh, out of the uh, 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 oysters and, and, and they had the stenchy smell, onica. Uh, and so there was a stench, but when you mixed it with the fragrance of the oils and the frankincense, it had a sweet smell, but it had to be crushed. It had to, had to be beaten down. It represents my Jesus being beaten down to become a sweet smell in the nostrils of God as he takes all of our sins away so you can enter into his presence. My God today. Prayers for the sense of incense is a sweet smell. And your prayers become a sweet smell. Power of prayer is heard and is revealed. And I've learned that, that revelation is manifestation. It's not there's a revelation that he's going to do it. It's the manifestation of, let me just type that in there. So I'm put that in there. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So look for the manifestation of, 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 of the word of God. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. The manifestation. Because it is a constant growing of the vision of it being enlightened to the will of God. and Enlightened to understand that, that God has so much more for us. Uh-huh. And so... So let, let us get to that place where the manifestation of God's word becomes an answer to your prayers. Amen. Amen. And so, so keep praying, keep believing, keep holding on to God's unchanging word. The rent to entrance of the rent of the veil, the suffering of Jesus, the love and the power of Jesus. This is the renting of the veil from the top down. Do you know that the earth stopped and, 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 and shook and the veil rent from the top down that represents that Christ entered you in the flesh. His, he was already in you, but what he did was he broke that veil that you don't have to have wait for anybody else. You can come right now. You can come to me. Because I took your sins and I'll reconcile you. I'm the judge. I'm your advocate. I sit at the right hand of God. I, and when you go to the court and you see the judge, there's always a bailiff. There's always the man there, the woman there with an armed guard around them. That, that, that's the Holy Spirit that's there to, to work with you, to protect you, to guide you, to speak to you. There can't be angels all around you from the suffering of Jesus uh, that he gave you the gift of sanctification. Sanctification, meaning that I've set you apart. Ah, the most holy court is also known as the holies of holies, where the place where God resides himself in the old tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, contained the manna from heaven. It contained the tablets and the ten rods, the budding of, of the rod of Aaron, and the wings of the cherubim covered the Ark of the Covenant. And this is God's meeting place with Moses. And so I'm going to stop there because we've talked about uh, we've talked about this outer court uh, experience before. The, uh, the last couple of weeks, we've talked enough about that. Uh, so I don't want to keep going back over that. But confessing, repenting, I do want to cover this. Uh, another principle of prayer is illustrated when Jesus cast out all, all the temple, and, has been, and, and for they have made the house of prayer a, a den of thieves. Everything going on in the church but prayer. Jesus calls that this whole, this whole lesson about the tabernacle really is 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 the Levitical priest praying that they took care of the temple and the place of God as a place of worship because they were praying to God. 
And so how can you not have a prayer life? So the principal prayer is illustrated when Jesus cast out all the, from the temple those that were called to the house of the, the den of thieves. Thus we find similarities in a woven and out of court relationship with God the Father and the New Testament of the gospel of Jesus. Both the Old and the New Testament confirm that are all required to wash. And this begins by confessing. This begins with repenting, asking God to turn you away from your daily sin, that you don't practice sin no more. That you ain't, you ain't running around gangbanging no more and, and staying high where you can't even think. Or you're getting ready to go shoot somebody because they stepped on your new shoes. Or they cussed you. But we, we don't reverence God and we can't reverence people. Throughout the Bible, we, are, we see a consistent pattern of Jesus being both in and of everything that existed. The Bible reveals that Jesus received from God the baptism of the Holy Ghost before he began his ministry. So all of these uh, points that I'm sharing, uh, these, these nuggets, believers, listen to this, believers, believers, this is us, this is you and I as believers, as believers, okay? Believers are required to wash, to be renewed, to be refreshed by the quick. That's what the Holy Ghost does for you when you pray. That's why it says, I know not what to pray for without the unction of the Holy Spirit. There's the place you have to get through because the your natural mind is not uh, capable of just accepting the will of God. And so, so at done certain years ago, in the closing, Jesus requires us He's modeling for us and implementing a spiritual pattern that's interwoven into the fabrics of the Old Testament and to the very fabric of your faith walk with Jesus. I want to read that again. That's why it took me two years and a half years to write this. I didn't write this. I'm, I'm saying this. I didn't write that. <laughs> if there's going to be a spiritual awakening, a growth or a turnaround, a transformation, and renewing one's mind to be reborn or refreshed as a new creature in Christ Jesus. It requires you, me, all of us as, as, as seeking God to, to model and to implement the spiritual patterns of Jesus that are interwoven into the fabrics, this word of the Old Testament, the Bible, into the fabric of your faith, which is the word of God in your walk with Jesus. And it was done centuries ago and it's still going on. As you give yourself as a living sacrifice, confessing your sins and faults before Jesus, asking God to give you a repentant heart, a contrite heart that I'm heartily sorry, continuing in prayer with Jesus Christ and living a Christ-centered life. Waiting and trusting on the Holy Spirit, it quickens the believer's ability and authority to do the work of the ministry. See, the problem with the body of Christ today is, is, is we don't realize how holy and sacred the work we're called to do because we, we don't really know who we are and who we are and the power of God that's in you to do greater greats. Stop being satisfied with normalcy. Expect your miracles. Expect your blessings. Walk by faith and study God's word and live. A, have a christ in life. Delight thyself in the, the name of the Lord. So I'm going to close with that. So as you continue your journey in this court, always keep in remembrance these factors. The array and diversity of colors, the items and the furniture, the types of metal, stones, wood, the pure oil of, of olive oil, the, the spices, the clothing, use of numbers of herbs and olive oils all reveal the order, the preparation, the service in the courts of the tabernacle. These are spiritual foundational truths from heaven, again, weaved into the fabric of the tabernacle and into your life of all believers. It's crocheted into you. It's made into you. It's embroidered into you. The ministry of Jesus Christ and his relationship with the children of Israel 
through his crucifixion and resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and the coming forth of the comforter are all part of our Christian journey. And let us not forget he's coming back. He is coming back. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, this is Elder Anton Seals of AJS Ministry, uh, and, and, and we're going to conclude on that note uh, that I just finished reading from uh, the tabernacle that dwells in you, and we'll start on page 79. We're still going to be on the outer court this, in, in this particular chapter. I think there's um, it was 20 some pages. Uh, I think 25, so we're, we're halfway through this chapter. There's so much more to, to learn. I don't want to rush through this. I pray that you're getting something out of this. Thank you for staying on with me. We've been on since uh, about 2.15. Uh, and some people say, well, why are y'all so long? Because they stay with me. Because <laughs> if, they, if they told me, since you're staying too long, I'm sure that... But, but Sister Willa May has been with me, and so, well, and, uh, evangelist Jeanette Kruger, uh, uh, Brother Stan knows, he knows when I pray, I, I get caught up. I, it's, not, it's, it's not boasting, brothers and sisters in Christ. I pay a price. <laughs> it ain't easy. It's a lonely place. And I hope I'm speaking to somebody, Clarence. Uh, it's a lonely place sometimes. I found in that loneliness that I'm never alone. <laughs> When I step out of me and I allow Jesus to have his way, let the Holy Ghost take over because he's always there. When, when, when I suffer with the spirit of, of rejection, as I have for years, the Holy Ghost shares something with me to put in my toolbox, Willa May. This is for you, uh, Brother Nevels and Evangelist Kruger and Brother Clarence and to all of you listening. The reason you feel rejected it's because God wants to take that out of you. That's, that, that rejection is something there that's in, in, that is either dealing with your ego, your pride, or your pain that God wants to cleanse you from so the enemy can't use it to distract your mind. You're looking, let me speak from my vantage point. I was looking for people to appreciate me, to value me, to love me, to respect me. And the, the most important thing for me was to just respect me. I don't, I don't need you to do nothing else. Just be kind enough to be thoughtful. God said, take your mind off of that. Have I not answered every prayer? It may not come when you want it. And he also corrects you, lets you know that if you've done what I told you to do, Years ago, somebody you created. So I allowed you to go through because I knew that eventually that you would yield. <laughs> so that rejection, God wants to take that out of you and fill it up with his presence where it won't bother you no more. When people don't want to be bothered with you, don't want to talk to you, don't they don't like you and don't even know why they don't like you. You feel rejected because you want ministers and people like that to, to do what? What is it that they can give you that God can? You want to teach in a university and I gave you the world. I gave you the universe. This message can go all over the world and you ain't got to walk out your house. Be careful what you ask for. That came to me. Lord, I want to I want to teach at a university. I, I want to teach uh, ministers. I, I want to, but I want you to teach my people. They'll become ministers. So God, I'm asking God to, to I'm not asking God just because I want people on. I want, I want people to get saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and discover the power of God that's in you. You're looking at a walking miracle. The pain I've been through to stay on a morphine as a medication prescribed 180 milligrams a day, and my brain ain't fried. Now, you talk to my wife, she might tell you something different. Now, that man didn't lost his mind. He went out here and stood in front of an empty store, and nobody promised to show up. And she was amazed when over 30 people showed up. So was I. <laughs> When the Holy Ghost told me, stand, say, go, uh, Clarence, I want you to go over there and stand in front of uh, Toys Us and pray. What? Do what? 
<laughs> oh, Jesus. 68 years old. That's almost, uh, actually, that was in 1968. Uh, 19, uh, no, no, 2018. The first prayer we did in October, the, I was in the hospital for 11 days. Had so many blood clots, they didn't know how you could breathe. But God saved me. But, but Minister Willie Johnson, Mr. Willie Johnson, who's part of our Monday prayer and Wednesday prayer, he, he, he made sure the prayer went forward. God answers the prayers, brothers. Did I know how many people were going to show up? No. Did people think you were crazy? Yes. That's when you really know you're doing something different. <laughs> Trust God. Have a little laughter. It's good medicine. Smiling and joy. Don't let the enemy rob you of your joy. That's what that's what that's what rejection does. It robs you because your mind will be stayed on worrying. And God did not give you a spirit of worry. He gave you a spirit of love, a sound mind. He gave you everything you need. Brother Stanley, I love you, brother. Thank you for always being available and encouraging me. I did stay on listening to the one Wakanda. Um, brothers and sisters, um, um, next time he has a, uh, uh, he has his, he's on, I, I want to, uh, if it's okay, um, um, Evangelist and Clarence and Sister Willamay and others, if you'd like to know more about Wakanda, come, come off mic and share real quick in closing, Stan, what it is you're doing, because he's, they're talking about uh, different things about health. They're talking about how the, uh, cannabis can be healthy for your bodies, the right kind. Um, so there's a lot involved. Can you, in, in a few minutes, just take the opportunity to give a commercial of what you're doing? And if they want information, I'll send them uh, your information. I won't pass out their information. Anyone hearing something that you'd like us to share? or you want to reach us, uh, it's all on our Facebook page, 773-234-3108, uh, 773-234-3108, or ajsmprayerline at gmail.com, ajsmprayerline at gmail. Stan, uh, give us some thoughts, uh, uh, share some of um, what you guys are doing uh, and how they can connect with you if they want to. And give me something. That Thank you. Give me a flyer or something. I'll put it up next week to direct people to you all. Okay, thank you. Um, basically, for everyone, that uh, since I've been off work for about seven years now, I've been watching a lot of things on YouTube and things of that nature. And I'm always concerned about people's health. Uh, we, we pray a lot, and I, I do appreciate it, and I do know the power of God will work in his word. But also I've learned that there are things that we can do to uh, protect our temples that was never taught in school. So we have uh, another science that has been created. Uh, it's probably been around for a while. And then, uh, like the Old Testament, it's dealing with the blood type. So if you know your blood type, uh, A, B, or O, there are certain foods that you shouldn't eat, and there's certain foods that you uh, that's acceptable. We know that in the New Testament, the Bible says everything are, is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but everything is not permissible. So we, tr I'm trying to get into the science so I can help people because we have too many diabetics in our community. We got too many people dying of heart attacks. And it's, it's contrary to what we're living. So I'm going to change that around. And I have a group. It's called a Wakanda, W-A-K-A-N-N-A, -A, 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 a group of four Black women who started this um, group about three years ago. And so we're doing mostly in Chicago, but it's also in other uh, states. So we want to get our people healthy. And uh, so we starting with that, we're going we're gonna to do scans so we could look at, instead of taking your clothes off, you're gonna, they we're going to do scans, but it could tell you which organs are beginning to go bad or which ones are, are bad. And then we can reverse that process. And so you know, a young man said he's about 71 years young, and we can reverse that. 
is the way he, because your blood recirculates every 21 days. So you could create new life cells which give you energy. So I'm excited uh, for the journey. And uh, thank uh, Elder for giving me an opportunity just to mention it in case you hear it from around, uh, um, from somewhere, somewhere else, they begin to do YouTube and things of that nature. But I'm excited because I know the trend is that seem like the doors are opening for more minorities now. And that um, you, you'll see me. If you see an improvement on me, then you know. <laughs> so thank you, Elder. Amen. Uh, that's uh, Stan Nevels, okay. Deacon Stan Nevels. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Yeah. Okay. That's Deacon Stanley Nevels. Uh, we're sharing information about Wakanda, Wakanda, um, and I can share more information next week. What I've asked him to do, matter of fact, this yeah. Thursday, if you have a flyer when we're on the Thursday night podcast, uh, the Tabernacle Fire in you, I'd like to post that and, and give a commercial uh, to let people know if they're looking for information, um, I can share that information with them. And let's talk about getting someone on um, sometime in April uh, with you to talk about uh, on the podcast, um, be a guest. Yeah. You okay. Know, you be, uh, so make that available. Sounds good. This is Elder Anton Seals. Um, I'm sorry, what were you saying, Stan? I know time is. I'm I said that's now. good. Thank you. I said that's good. Thank you. It's just a slight. Uh, Time difference, I think, that we hear air codes. We'll work that out. Um, we'll work it out. Uh, so, people of God, this is Elder Anton Seals of the, um, the AJS Ministry uh, um, weekly Tuesday Bible class at 2 p.m. Uh, we started about 2.15 today, and it's almost two hours. Forgive me for being so so long, but, you know, when you go to a basketball game, or you watch a movie, uh, you can endure so I pray, and I thank you, um, uh, uh, Deacon Stanley. Thank you, Clarence. Thank you, uh, Evangelist Jeanette Kruger. Thank you, Willa, Sister e uh, uh, Started Carl Evangelist. Uh, she does some awesome work. She's been working with people in the church. Um, I'm surprised she's not a minister, but in her spirit, she is. She's a servant of God, and she's done some marvelous things. She's very humble, and she doesn't talk a lot about stuff that she's done for the body of Christ. And I thank God and pray God that, that even what you're doing right now with your uh, granddaughter, uh, such a miracle. Uh, is that granddaughter or great granddaughter? Great granddaughter. And I, I, th I thank God for Yasmin to see the love that you pour into her. Sometimes you'll see her holding her grand, great grandbaby in her arms on this podcast. To people of God that are listening to this, if you are at home and you have nothing to do at two o'clock, Join us. It, it is no registration free, no gimmicks. We'll send you information. We'll send you the syllabus. Uh, give you information on. Uh, you can get the book online at uh, an ebook and follow along. Uh, it's a little different than than being on a, a big screen, uh, but we we just know that this teaching will help you. It will it will bring you to a different relationship and understanding who you are in your tabernacle, in your meeting place with God. And why it's so important to reverence the holiness of, of God in your prayer life and to trust God and draw closer to him. I'm going to sign out. We'll be back on next Tuesday. We're going to finish up on chapter three. Uh, and so um, we may go longer than 16 weeks. Uh, one of the things that I've learned in this uh, process is to uh, just let God have his way. I thank Clarence who just went off. He's at work, takes his lunch break. Uh, thanking God for him um, to just, and he's probably driving around in his job with headset on, listening, uh, but he's faithful. He's faithful to prayer. Uh, so thank you, Evangelist Kruger. Thank you, Willa May. Thank you so much, Stan. Thank you to the listening audience, whoever you are, wherever you are. If you, if you see this video on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube page. Please share it with other people. Uh, we're trying to get this word out because it's the word of God. And if there's ever time people need something, let them eat of this word. Let them get in this word. Let them hear the message. And I believe that it'll make a difference in people's life. We can make a difference, all of us, one person at a time. God bless you. Peace of God be with you. Father, I thank you for every opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I thank you, God. I'm grateful for all that you're doing. Thank you for healing and delivering. Thank you for making a way. Thank you for those that sow a seed, God, that even the computer, the, the cameras, or whatever we have, we thank you, God, because people are sown into this ministry. And God, we want people to see the manifestation of your work, not just in the natural, but in the spiritual, that their lives begin to change and the manifestation of your glory in their lives, their children, their families, their neighbors, do it for your glory, God. The world is crying out and, and you're crying over the world saying, come back to me. So Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus and I beg of all you, I beseech you, people of God, you are the candle of the Lord. And we are the light of the world that God wants his light to shine. He's the light of the world. We're the candles of the Lord. The light that shineth in you needs a refreshing. You need some fresh oil from God through Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. So come close and let him fill you up every day in Jesus. And eat of this bread, you'll hunger no more. Drink of this water, you'll thirst no more. This is your host, Elder Anton Sales, on the uh, weekly Bible class on Tuesdays. And we look forward to seeing you next week. And some of you, we see you on Thursday. We hope you'll join us Thursday at 7, uh, 7 o'clock. God bless everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.